Amen. Well, we're in a series about the family, what the family is, and it just happens that this week would be about parenting and parents. Okay, maybe that wasn't an accident. Maybe that was planned, but we are in the series we're calling Family Matters, and we're talking today about parents. It matters how you raise your children. That matters. It really is important. As we dedicate our children to the Lord, what we really are saying is that we are dedicated to living godly lives in front of our children. We will train them up to know and serve God. This dedication is Father saying, I will make sure my children are raised properly and with a spiritual relationship to God. It's Mother saying, I will do everything I can to support my family and give my children the proper picture of what a godly family looks like. It's parents saying, we will demonstrate hard work and love that a family should have for each other. It really is a family wanting to live the example given in the Bible. That's what this dedication is. So let's look at the example of what fathers and mothers should be like in God's Word. Where else can we turn to? Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Now, we love Ephesians 6 1 as parents, don't we? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that thy days may be long upon the earth. When I was a kid, I knew this verse. Those three verses there. And I knew the promise that went with it. That if I obeyed my parents, I would live long. I don't know if I'm going to live long. Here's what I'm thinking. I'm going to get to live a little bit longer than God would have taken me because I obeyed my parents. Because <laughs> you, if you know me, you know I'm usually in trouble. But as we get down to verse 4, it says, Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Now listen, this is speaking to fathers when it says the second part here. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Fathers have the responsibility of making sure their children are raised properly. You, you catching? I mean, very quickly in this in this sermon, we're going to realize what's wrong with America, don't we? But bring them up in the nurture. The commandment to fathers is that us fathers make sure our children are brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He says, bring them up. He gives the responsibility to the fathers to make sure their children are educated properly. In the, so this is to men, right? We, we can't get away from it. This is to men. And let me give you another example in the Bible. Because I've had men tell me, well, it's my wife's job to bring up the kids, not mine. Well, let's look at the Bible. And, and we found Ephesians 6. 4. Well, that's only one verse. Look in 1 Timothy 3, 4. 1 Timothy 3, 4. Now, here's the qualifications for a deacon. Okay? Now, we believe that deacons are men. So, when we give a qualifications for a deacon, it's, it's written to men, we believe, right? And listen to the qualification of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4. The Bible says, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Wait a minute. There's the second verse is telling the fathers that we are the ones... To make sure our children are raised properly. In America, we're having a problem with this, aren't we? We have absent fathers who aren't there to do what they are supposed to. The Bible says you're having his children in subjection. What's that mean? Making sure they're properly raised. To have kindness. To have respect. Fathers are supposed to make sure their children are raised. Then the Bible says in Ephesians 6, 4, they're supposed to come up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So what do these two words mean? We have to understand these words to be able to understand what God wants for us. So nurture, according to strong concordance, means education or training by implication, disciplinary correction, chastening, chastisement, instruction, nurture. So according to Strong's Dictionary, nurture means correction. Now what are we correcting them to do? Are we just to correct them for... With no purpose? No. There's a purpose. There should be a purpose in our correction. What? What's the last phrase of that verse? 
of the Lord. The correction of the Lord. This means that when our children do something the Bible says not to do, we're to correct that. We're to use discipline. Now, I want to tell you something. I don't believe in beating children, but I thank the Lord that my parents spanked me. I don't know what your kids are like. I've got two different kids, and I mean two different kids. I can look at one and about put one in tears. The other one, I can beat half to death, and they just look at me and say, what next? You know? And I was the one that could be beat half to death and go, what's next? And so I understand that if my parents, you know, I've told some, some of the stories about my life. I, I used to get parents paid me and I'd tell all the stories about my life in the youth department. Because I, I don't want, you know, I don't want the, my kids to hear all that you did. You know, and, and I was... I was the kind of kid that my mom said, okay, you're grounded. You know, well, let's try these mental punishments because they work, right? They said, Carl, go to your room. Well, that was a window in my room. <laughs> With no screen. <laughs> so one day, my mom sent me to my room. I decided it was time to play. I went out the window. I was probably third or fourth grade. I mean, I wasn't just a little tyke. I mean, I was old enough to know. I went down the street to play. And I had taken my Hot Wheels with me, and we were playing. We would made tracks in one of my friend's yard, and we were playing down there. And I look down towards my house, and my mom comes out and looks at me. Now, a smart child would have gone home right then. That's not what I did. I told my friends. I remember it clear as day saying to my friends, guys, my mom's fixing to come beat me to death. But I'm going to play till she gets here. <laughs> So my mom come down with a belt down the street and said, Carl, you're supposed to be in your room. Let's go. And the whole way, just whoosh, whoosh. You know what? Mental punishments. Phew. But I didn't like pain. There's a difference between discipline and spanking and beating your children. There's a line that we should not cross in that. Spanking your children when you're angry is a dangerous line to walk. But waiting too long to discipline them is also a dangerous line to walk because they forgot what they did wrong. So maybe mom spanks him if dad has the temper. Or maybe dad spanks him if mom has the temper. But we have to give correction, discipline. The second word in this verse is admonition. According to Strong's Concordance, it means calling attention to mild rebuke or warning, admonition, encouraging them to go the right way. So we discipline the wrong way. We encourage them to go the right way. Some people, I, I was talking to a parent a couple weeks ago, and she said, you know, my first two kids, I corrected. And that put them back on the right path. My third kid, correction, they just laugh at it. I had to reward the good. And she goes, that's harder. It's easy to spank for wrong, and hopefully that puts them on the right path. It's hard to see good and say, oh, i got to stop. That was very good. I'm glad you did that. But you know, some kids respond to that encouragement, admonition, correction, pushing the right direction, going the right direction. But both of these phrases, both, both nurtured admonition, are modified by that last phrase, of the Lord. Our nurture admonition should push our children or direct them towards the Lord, not towards our way of thinking. A lot of times we want to produce little us's. You've got to act just like me because I'm not embarrassed when you act this way. Guys, it's not about us. The Bible didn't say bring them up, bring them up in the nurture and admonition of yourself. It said to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Therefore, we have to know what the Lord says is right and wrong to correct those things, not what we don't like. Now, there is some of that. You don't want your kids to be rude and disrespectful and stuff like that. But we also, I, I, I remember when I was a kid, my friend told me the story that him and his, their family were eating at the dinner table. And his older sister reached and spilt her milk on the table. She got a spanking. They cleaned it up, sat back down. They go to eating, and Dad spills a drink. Well, let's go. Didn't happen, does it? 
that consistency in our lives to correct sin and understand what is sin and what's not sin. Right? There's accidents sometimes, and you know what? We make them too, don't we? Accidents, not sin. But nurture and admonition, direction, correcting to what the Lord says. Fathers are supposed to bring their children up with the discipline or education of the Lord. This brings us to the second part of what fathers are to do. They are to make sure their children are raised properly and also have the correct religious training. One of the promises we made that the, these parents would direct their kids to have, to have the salvation that God's called them to. To encourage the salvation in their life. Fathers, that is our responsibility to direct our families toward salvation. To teach them about it. So, you, so fathers need to know how you get to heaven. Because you know what? Every good father wants their children to go to heaven, don't they? Every good father wants their children to join them in heaven. So every father needs to know how to get there. The first thing that everyone needs to know is that God loves you. Do you know that? God loves you. It doesn't matter who's in here, what you've done. It doesn't matter your past. It doesn't matter what you've been involved in. God loves you. He cares about you. And you know what? His love is his motivation for you. God is also the judge. And he's an honest judge. So he has to make sure that sin is punished. Because he's a good judge. And what do judges do? They punish wrongdoing. So God came up with a plan so that we don't have to pay for our own sins. And you know how he did it? He paid for our sins for us. The judge stepped down and paid our punishment. It's as if we, we went into court and we're standing before the judge and the judge says you've sinned and you're guilty. And when we accept salvation, we say, you're right, I am guilty and I can't do anything. And the judge says you're guilty. Then he walks down beside us and he says, I'll pay the penalty. And that's what he did for you. He said, you can't pay the penalty. And I love you so much that I'm going to pay the penalty for you. I have to judge sin. Somebody has to pay for sin. So God said, I'll send my son to pay for your sin. And he says, you're guilty. And I have to judge sin. But I will pay for sin. And you know what he asks us to do? Accept that payment. He says, accept my payment on your behalf. You see, if we don't accept his payment on our behalf, when Jesus went to the cross, he did not deserve death. He would have lived continuously. Because he, death, sin was not upon him. And when he went to the cross, he laid down his life. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I give up the ghost. He intentionally died on purpose. Because he didn't deserve it. And he took my sin... And he says, I'm going to pay for Carl's sin by death because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And, and, and I'm guilty before God. And he says, Carl, I'll go to the cross and I'll die even though I don't deserve it to pay for your sin. And all I'm asking you to do is accept my, the penalty I paid for you. Accept that. You see, I can't pay the penalty for my sins. I'm guilty. There's no righteousness in me, the Bible tells me. And, that, and this is why people go to hell. The only reason people go to hell is they do not accept Jesus paying their penalty. They choose to pay their own penalty. Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine if you went to court and you had a speeding ticket and there was a person in the courtroom that day and you stand before the judge and he says, you're guilty of speeding, the fine is this much. Can you imagine a person in the back saying, I'll pay it. Now, would you go, no, I'd rather pay it myself. And if you would, you're lying. You go, well, cool. I get, I get somebody else to pay my penalty. And that's what Jesus did for your sins. He paid the penalty for your sins. And he says, all you have to do is accept it. And you get to go to heaven. What a God. What a Savior. To love us so much that he says, I'll do it. I'll go to the cross. I'll take a death I do not deserve because... I want to make sure that Carl, that, that you don't go to hell. So he paid 
for our sins with his blood on the cross. When we realize how much Jesus loves us, that he would go to the cross and die when he didn't deserve to, we'll want to obey him, won't we? Because we know he's only motivated by love for us. He loves you so much. He cares for you so much. He says, I want to give you joy. In 1 John verse 4, it says that we can have joy if we trust in Jesus. That's where we get our joy, is in Jesus and following him. Fathers, it's our responsibility to make sure our kids understand this and tell them. Second this morning, mother's responsibility. We talked about the father's responsibility. Now we're talking about mother's responsibility. Look in Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. If you find Psalms, it's right behind that. Psalms, Proverbs chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 1. Proverbs 14, 1. Wise mothers build their house according to God's word. Proverbs 14, 1 says, Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. Uh, as you read this verse, you go, Wow, well, of course a wise woman builds house. Adams Clark, his commentary says this, By her prudent and industrious management, she increases property in the family, furniture in the house, and food and raiment for her household. This is the true building of a house. The, thriftful, the thriftless wife acts differently, and the opposite is the result. Household furniture far beyond, uh, is not increased, it's dilapidated. Her household is ill-fed, ill-clothed, and worse educated. A mother wants to build her house. And what is our house is made up of? People. We're not talking about structure. Just like the church is not these buildings. This is where the church meets, right? The church is the people. This church meets here. Cypress Creek Baptist Church meets at this facility. In the same way, the family is the people that make up the family. The house is the people that make up the family. So a wise mother builds, helps build wealth. She maintains the house. She makes sure her family has food and clothes. Doesn't this sound like today's woman? The most important thing a mother does is build her children. Love her children. Today, she, a mother builds wealth because most mothers have jobs, right? In our society. She still maintains the house, cooks, buys clothes, cleans, and does all these things. You know why? Because moms love their family. Because moms care for their house. Look at Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8. Oh, just a few chapters earlier, Proverbs 1, 8 says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law. Proverbs 31 describes the virtuous woman. It starts in verse 10. It says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he will have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. She considereth the field, and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength, and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, and her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretches out her hand to the poor, yea, she reaches forth her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing. And she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and, her, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord... 
She shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Here we find a description of a woman that's amazing. And we can go through this real quick. Think about this. A wise woman is worth more than money, according to verse 10. It'll, it'll make a marriage, a family awesome to have a wise woman. A husband can trust a wise woman with his wealth, according to verse 11. We can trust it. You know, some relationships, you've got to watch what credit cards people have, husbands and wives and, and stuff like that. Not this virtuous woman. She can be trusted with wealth. She will always look to benefit her husband, according to verse uh, 12. She'll Look in verse 12. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Ephesians 5.21 is our basis for marriage. Uh, Clifton, put that up on the screen for me. Ephesians 5.21 says, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You see, husbands sometimes submit to their wives. And wives sometimes submit to their husbands. It's a partnership. Now, God says when, there's a, when it comes to a point you can't agree and stuff, somebody's got to take the lead. And the Bible ordains the man to, to take the lead in that situation. But you know what, guys? There's times we need to submit to our wives, just like these wives and this virtuous woman submitted to her husband. He could trust her. She works hard. Some of you ladies work outside the home, and that's hard. Some of you work just like this woman outside the home in verse 13 through 17. That takes in, in, to be industrious and do those things to work. She does the best work possible and prepares for the future, according to verse 18. The spindle and the distaff are the most ancient instruments for making thread. This wise wife will do the menial task, if that's what it takes, according to verse 19. She'll do whatever it takes. She has compassion to the needy, according to verse 20. She's made sure her house has what they need to survive difficult situations, according to verse 21, where it says, she's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her house are clothed with scarlet. Her children, she knows are taken care of because she's prepared for that early. She's not worried about difficult circumstances. She makes herself look nice, according to verse 22. Look at that. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. <clears throat> Sometimes, ladies, your husband wants you to dress up a little bit. Look nice. That makes him happy. And this woman knows that, and she does that. She helps her husband to, husband to succeed in verse 23, where he's sitting in the gates. She would do all the work needed for her business to succeed, according to verse 24. Strong and beautiful is her moral, moral character, according to verse 25. Her advice is wise and kind, according to verse 26. She's not lazy, according to verse 27. She's admired by her husband and her kids, according to verse 28. And I think that verse is the biggest one to show this virtuous woman. Because if your children and your husband, who you live with 24 hours a day, they see you in the good and the bad, if they admire you, you have virtue. You are respected. There are many wise women, but a woman that fears God is praised as the best, according to verse 29 and 30. And her actions speak louder than her words, according to verse 31. Look what it says. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in, her ga in the gates. It's what she does, her works, that praise her. In other words, she acts correctly. And she does all these things we've talked about so people praise her because she lives correctly. Moms, that's a pretty high standard to live to, isn't it? But the Bible says this is a virtuous woman. This is the goal to get to. Number three this morning, the example. Go back in Ephesians 5, verse 1. Ephesians 5, 1. We were in Ephesians 6. We've been around there. But Ephesians 5 and 6 talks a lot about the family. The final thing is the example. The example. As parents, we give an example to our children, right? And, and God gives us an example as parents. Look at in Ephesians 5, 1. Be therefore followers of God as dear, dear children. Look at verse 2. And walk in love as Christ himself for us. I'm sorry. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. There's a picture here in this verse. 
And the picture is that, that we are to be as dear children. Be, therefore, followers of God as dear children. Can I ask you a question? What do children copy? Who do they copy? You remember that old song, I want to be just like you because he wants to be like me? Kids copy us. I wish they didn't because usually they copy my bad attributes, not my good ones. You know, I want to pick which ones they copy, right? Don't you? And we see that in our kids. They're just like us, and that makes us mad because they're just like us. And we fight and argue with them because they're just like us. And the Bible here is giving us this picture, but the word followers, be therefore followers of God, that word followers actually means imitators. <clears throat> you see the picture here? We are supposed to be imitators of God as children imitate their parents. We're supposed to imitate God. We're supposed to look like Him. We are to be imita imitators just like children do. That scares us, don't we? That means we have to live in front of them what God calls us to do. If our children are going to imitate us, then what should we look like? We need to be godly. We need to be faithful. We need to be hardworking. Not just because it's good for us, because all those things make us successful, but not just because of that, but also because our children are imitating us. The principle's taught in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, right? Let me read you 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. The Bible here gives a pattern that we can live by. And it says that, that you can do that. Why don't you put that up, Clifton? You'll probably get there faster than I can. Oh, I got it. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And the things that thou hast heard among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You see what happens here? Is we get the things we know. We teach it to faithful men. Those people are going to imitate us because we're teaching them, right? Just like a parent-child relationship then those people are going to tell somebody else, which hopefully finds faithful people tell somebody else. But that's the same picture of the parent-child relationship, right? We as parents teach our children. They imitate us. We should teach them godliness and, and right living and how to be raised in the correct way. Then guess who they're going to teach? <coughs> Their children. You affect your grandchildren by how you treat your children. Is that not scary? Scares me. The beginning of going back in Ephesians 5, 1, the beginning of the verse tells us to be followers or imitators of God. Just like children imitate parents, parents need to imitate God. We need to be loving and sacrificial for our children. Verse 2, and walk in love as Christ. There we go again. We're trying to be like Christ. As Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God. Jesus sacrificed himself for us. And we as parents need to be sacrificial for our children. That doesn't mean give them everything they want. That means give them everything they need, spiritually and physically. Wants, you give them all your wants, you're spoiling them. The best thing we can do for our kids, guys, is to be imitators of God. To be what he wants us to be. As we all know, being a parent's not easy, is it? <laughs> I wish I could tell the Smiths and the dog. I wish I could tell you guys, it's going to get easy from here. This has been the hard part, changing diapers. <laughs> yeah, the, the parents and grandparents are laughing, going, I want to encourage you guys that it's worth everything. Our children are a heritage, the Bible tells us. It is awesome to be a parent and to see your kids grow and be mature. But there's a problem. If we don't raise them correctly, they're not going to be good. Now, they're not good on themselves. But you understand in society what... You go to a classroom, okay? Go to your kids, your grandkids, last day of school party. Yeah, I see parents laughing that maybe you've already been this year. And you can quickly tell the ones that have discipline in their life and the ones that don't. And if it's not going to be easy to be consistent and to discipline and to bring them up as God wants them to. And they're going to fight, right? Parents, grandparents, they're going to fight. But the fight is worth it. To bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord is worth it. 
When your kids love God more than they do anything else, you just love it. When your kids say, Dad, that's not what the Bible says, you gulp, but you say, okay, show me. <laughs> when your kids love God, that's what we're trying to have happen here. It takes hard work both at job and at home to be a good parent. It takes love, even hard love sometimes, to be a good parent. It takes sacrifice. Fathers have a huge responsibility, and we see in America what happens when fathers don't take that responsibility seriously. We as fathers are responsible to make sure our children get an education, both physical and spiritual. Mothers have an endless job. In today's society, they both keep the house and work a job. They are stressed as thin as anyone in our society. Many times in our society, they're both mother and father and provider and everything else in that family. And they sacrifice continuously. Ladies, it's not in vain. It's worth it. It's worth it. Your children... And family need you to be strong. They need you to be strong. And as parents work together, they give our children the picture of love and sacrifice that Jesus lived. Today, more than ever, we need good parents. Let's pray. God, as we look in your word and we see the, what it takes for, for dads, for moms, we understand that, Lord, it's not easy. This, this world's difficult. God, as we bring children in this world, man, we have to consider what all's happening. But God, you said that if we train up a child, if we train them the way you've talked about, they will not depart from it. So Lord, help us to be parents who follow what you teach, who love how you love, who sacrifice like you sacrifice who follow your example and do whatever it takes to provide the training, both physical and spiritual, all their needs. And God, that we would love them even if it's with tough love. That God, we would be parents that are dedicated to bringing our children up the way you've told us. God, I pray for grandparents that they would come alongside parents to do this. I pray for for aunts and uncles, church, everything, that we would be there to care for and love these families and help them to bring their children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Lord, lead us in our lives and show us what you have to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand for a verse of invitation. As Brother Al leads us, we'll sing Room at the Cross for you. That spiritual application is for all of us. We all need Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, it's a great time to find out how much Jesus